Right, so welcome everybody to the sixth lecture on stochastic thermodynamics. Uh, as usual, before starting, I leave the, the room for questions. Maybe one question, if, if any. If not, uh, we'll go on. Okay, it seems no questions. So uh, today's lecture, as I anticipated yesterday, will be about information demons. So. Uh, in particular, I'll discuss methods of extracting work that do not rely on having two thermal baths, like in, a, in a heat engines, which is what we discussed yesterday, or that do not rely on applying a force directly on the system, like when you do uh, work when you raise an energy level. This will be a different uh, pathway in extracting work, which is by using information of a physical system. And before starting, uh, I give you a good reference to read, which is uh, the review paper uh, in Nature Physics that I showed in the top of my slide. Uh, this is a, a review paper containing lots of advances. It's a summary of lots of advances in stochastic thermodynamics uh, for systems which, which have information. So I highly recommend you to read. Uh, in particular, today I will present you three classic uh, paradigms of uh, information thermodynamics. One is the Maxwell demon, which you probably know very well. It's really a classic in thermodynamics. The second uh, is the one I show in the in bottom left. It's the Szilard engine, which is a, a smaller version of the Maxwell demon in which the demon is operating not between two thermal baths, but in a single thermal bath with a single molecule. So it's really a um, a key thought experiment in information thermodynamics, which uses the least possible um, elements to extract work from information. This is really, really important for the field. And also, I'll relate all this with the Nord principle, which is also an, a very important result in information thermodynamics. And later on, once I explain this, I will go into a framework of information thermodynamics, which we try to unify all these ideas and discuss also fluctuations of, of these systems. All right, so Maxwell Demon, uh, it's really a classic in, in thermodynamics. This was proposed by James Clerk Maxwell in, uh, in 1871. So it's really a, a long time ago where he was thinking already about this. This is published in, uh, in, in this paper, Theory of Heat, which I highly recommend you to, to look at it. And the idea of Maxwell Demon is is to devise, a, it was a thought experiment by back then in which we can reverse the thermodynamic arrow of time. So imagine you put in contact two uh, baths of uh, molecules that are at different temperatures. So imagine the, the bath in the left uh, is the temperature TA, which is colder than the one in the, uh, on the right. So uh, this is temperature TB. So this I, I can illustrate with the velocities of the particles. As you know from statistical mechanics, a bath with a high temperature means that the uh, magnitude of the velocities of the molecules are uh, of higher temperature means the magnitude of these velocities is larger than in the other case. So typically when you put in contact a hot bath with a cold bath, what do you expect? So you expect that the temperatures uh, equilibrate in an intermediate temperature between these initial temperatures. This is called the zero law of thermodynamics. And you expect that, that there should be a heat flow, in this case, from right to left. So from, from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir. This is what you expect. But what if now you think of a tiny demon, a small intelligent being that it can control a tiny door between these containers and open it and close it selectively in a very clever way. The clever way is as follows. Uh, when the demon sees that a molecule in the hot bath, sorry, the cold bath on the left, is it has an instantaneous velocity higher than the average, then the demon opens the gate. Why? Because this, this particular molecule is hotter than the average in the cold bath. So then it lets hot particles to move to the hot bath and vice versa, cold particles to move to the cold bath. In this way, well, this is fast and slow molecules as I show in my, in my uh, handwriting here. In this way, the demon can achieve that the cold, the bath that was cold gets colder and the bath that was hot gets hotter. This is an in apparent contradiction with the second law because this requires a heat flow in the opposite direction as the uh, temperature gradient. 
But this can be done thanks to the fact that the daemon uses information. So it's using information and changing the dynamics of the system every time it opens and closes the gate. This we call uh, in this field control or feedback control. It's doing feedback on the system. Okay, from the statistical mechanics points of view, this can be seen as okay, you have in the two thermal baths Maxwellian distributions, and you just look the, the demon opens and closes the gate when it sees rare events in these baths. For example, in the in the cold bath. Uh, molecules who have a velocity in this shaded area, which are above the, the average, are, and vice versa in the other path. And this way, you can change the temperature in the way I see. Okay, so this is really a classic, and it's something that shows that using information, you can get um, events that cannot be obtained uh, spontaneously from the second one. Okay. The next paradigm which was, was introduced by Leo Szilard, uh, and it is the following. It is a one molecule version of the Maxwell demon. So here you have many, many molecules, but now we will think of a demon that is operating on one molecule. So we have a container which contains only one particle, and every time the particle hits against the walls of this container, it equilibrates with the temperature of a thermal bath that is surrounding this container. So imagine now a demon that measures where is the particle, on the left or on the right half of the box. This demon can use this information cleverly in the following way. If it sees the particle on the left, like in the top I show here, it puts a piston on the right half and lets this piston move, be moved by the particle in a way that this is like an expansion of a gas of one molecule from volume V half to volume V. And vice versa, you can do the same when the particle is on the right side, on the right half of the, of the container. In this way, you see that the demon can cleverly attach a rope to this piston and use the expansion of the gas to lift a weight of a given mass. Of course, a small mass, because we are talking about one degree of freedom, which has a characteristic energy of kBT. So you will be able to, to lift a very, very small, tiny, tiny uh, mass. So at the end of the operation, the demon completes a cycle. So when the gas is uh, expanded reversibly, you return to the initial state. So in this sense, it can do cycles and extract work from a single thermal bath in a cyclic manner. This is against the formulation of second law. And it's a, so it's like a paradox with the second law. What we see here, if you think about uh, this system as an ideal gas will be the work done on the system is minus PVV. This is just uh, classical thermodynamics. On the second uh, quality, I use the law of ideal gases. So P is KVT divided by volume. And then I integrate from B half to V, and I get the work done on a cycle is negative. So I'm extracting work cyclically. This is really a, a, a big thing if you think about it. This is not something forbidden by the second law. So you get minus KVT log 2. Log 2 is positive, so minus KVT log 2 is negative. And uh, uh, what, what, what came next is the analysis of what is the demon doing? So the demon is measuring information. So it measures a bit. And this bit contains an amount of information that is exactly KBT log two. So if we, one takes into account the information in the entropy or in the energy balance, one recovers the second law. I am anticipating what, what's coming uh, later, OK? I'm seeing questions in the chat. Okay, what WR, okay, please, if you have a question, uh, I really encourage you to, to say it uh, by voice because it's difficult for me to follow the chat while I'm, I'm showing the slides, okay? WL and WR mean that WL is the work that you do given that the particle was measured to be in the left side. This is the, uh, the work done in this branch, in the top branch. And WR means the work done in the bottom branch. Of course, the, there will be half of the times you will take the top branch and half of the times you will, you will follow the branch in the bottom, okay? That's why I have here WL, but WL is equal to WR. And the average work over many cycles is one half WL plus WR. Is the average between the work done when you measure the particle on the left plus the work done when you measure the particle on the right. Okay, that's it, I solved your question. Alejandro Heredia. 
Yes, yeah, thanks. Okay, welcome. Thanks. Sorry, I have a question. Can I ask? Please, please go ahead. Yeah, so it, it is like a um, uh, means two-stroke engine, right? No, 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 no. This is different. The two-stroke engine is compression and expansion. Here, what you do is there is a demon and it's looking at, at the two boxes and then it sees if the box is left or right box. If it's on the left box, it puts a piston on the right half and then it let, lets it expand. Okay, so there's only expansion. There's no expansion and compression. It is just measurement and expansion. It is not too strong. What you have to understand from the top branch and the bottom branch is two different events that can happen. It means that if, if the, the molecule, when the demon is measuring, could be on the left box or on the right box, sorry, on the left half or on the right half. So it, it means there are two possible pathways in the same uh, um, cycle, okay? And it is an isothermal expansion. The temperature remains constant. Yes, it's an isothermal expansion, exactly. That's why I'm using this formula here. I don't know if you see my mouse. But I'm saying that the pressure, pressure times volume is KVT. So this is the law of ideal gases in isothermal conditions for a gas of one molecule. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> well. uh, professor, uh, is it equal to what is happening in the cells and we have gate uh, that can be activated or not uh, and in uh, very specific ways? Can the gate have the rule of this demon? Well, this is very brave to say, <laughs> I must say. Uh, of course, gates can be open or closed, but most of the times, for example, the ones I explained in my course, like ion channels, this opening and closing is from a, uh, th this is due to a fluctuation. So it's not due to a demon, which is measuring and which is doing something very clever, depending on the outcome of, of, a, of a molecule. This, this is a thought experiment. This is something that processes information. So I would not expect that the cell is doing this in general. I would expect more that things happen because of fluctuations. Uh, because in some point we are just uh, um, collecting more ions inside the, the cell while the potential inside the cell is upper than the environment. Yes, yes. Uh, so in a sense, the cell um, applies feedback uh, because it's, um, for instance, the opening and closing of, of, a, of a gate, of a channel, can depend on the concentration on one side of the membrane or another. So in this sense, you can see it as feedback, but not as a CLR engine. The CLR engine is a very particular thing, which is what I'm showing. It, but I agree with you that there will be, there is feedback in, in cells. And uh, this you can see, for example, in hearing, the, the ion channels in the ear open and close uh, with a different probability when, when there is more or, or when it's different calcium concentration. So there is feedback in, in biology, yes. In, in the broad sense, no, it's not that there are cellular engines <laughs> applying biology, doing a box. <laughs> so it's something more complex in general. So uh, some of the students uh, find it strange that you can apply the law of ideal gases to a gas of just one particle. I also do. I also do find this strange. Yeah, it's really an approximation, but um, well, it, I think, it, uh, uh, if I may, I think uh, this is because we are uh, looking at a quasi-static transformation. Yes, yes. And uh, the, if you think uh, that the piston moves uh, very, very slowly, there's a mass uh, much larger than yes. the one uh, of the particle, then uh, this is exactly what you get. Well, actually. Uh, there is a key assumption. I'm saying this expansion is reversible. Reversible means infinitely slowly, which is what Matteo is right now saying. So if you want to use the law of ideal gases, you're assuming at all intermediate times, you are in equilibrium. So you need to go infinitely slowly. It's really an idealization, this uh, demon. And it's a, it's a result valid for quasi-static driving as well. Yes, that's a, that's a key point as well. And also you assume the particle is a point <laughs> which is not <laughs> what it is as well, no? It's not a point. So ideal gases means the particles are points. They have no volume. Uh, but there has been a lot of corrections to this 
and uh, including excluded uh, volume effects and many particles in art. Uh, so this is really, really the most ideal situation you can find. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, not really, very, not really. It's like the mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. There is no T for one particle. There's no T for one particle here. We are saying there is a bath surrounding the, the, this box. And this bath is filled of 10 to the 23 molecules. The particle is a single particle that collides with the wall and then it equilibrates with the temperature of the environment with this real temperature. Okay, this is something very important. It is different to what I explained yesterday, which was temperature of a particle, which it was an effective temperature. Right? It is very intuitive, as you are saying, and there is a nice conversation here in the chat, uh, but please, uh, you can ask questions in real life as well. Sir, I had another question. Sure. Um, efficiency of slizzard in the engine will come out to be one, right? No, it will come out to be, uh, okay, okay, the efficiency. Uh, well, you cannot define efficiency in the way I, I explained yesterday, because I was uh, introducing efficiency as the ratio between the work and heat. Uh, well, he, here you can say, yes, there's a heat absorption of KVT of two and, and there's a work, well, you could say, yes, one, but uh, it is a big idealization on this process. So it's, it's not something we can, I mean, typically we don't think about efficiencies here in this, um, in this model, because there, there's not that the notion of two thermal baths as, like we have in, yeah. in heat engine. Th there it makes sense to talk about efficiency because there is a intake of heat and part of this hot uh, Q8 part is used as work and part is dissipated in the bath. Here is different, as you say, isothermal systems are not bounded by Carnot in efficiency, are bounded by one, as you say. Uh, then uh, then uh, how, why are we saying that this violates second law? Because uh, one of the corollaries of the second law is that you cannot extract work in a cyclic process uh, from a single thermal bath. This was uh, so proved by Clausius. It's not cyclic, right? I mean, how do yes, you- Yes, it, it, it's cyclic because you look at the left. On the left, you have the, the, the particle in a box in a full volume. And then when the daemon ends the cycle, well, <laughs> I'm just saying the cycle, the daemon uh, initially puts a piston and then it lets the piston expand from volume V halves to volume V. So once the, the expansion is, is done, the daemon takes out the piston. And this can be done at zero work with an ideal piston. Okay, oh. so the initial and the final state are the same. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. All right, I think I see that there are other questions. Uh, ideal gas. Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, this actually I, I explained this before. Uh, exactly. Okay, uh, let me go ahead because otherwise, I mean, this, this is a, a, a thought experiment which is key in information thermodynamics and we could do a, a lecture only about this, but um, I'd like to advance a little bit. Uh, and uh, the first thing I, I want to discuss is that uh, before you see that here, the probability for the particle to be on the left or on the right is one half. We are saying it is a perfectly symmetric situation, but you could do this uh, with a, uh, a bias, like a bias coin, instead of half half, you can have 70%, 30%. And you may wonder if biasing the, the, the state of the system or the measurement can lead to more work extraction. So you can say, as I show in the, in the top figure, there is a probability P to be on the left wall and probability one minus P to be on the right half. And this can be done, for example, by putting the barrier of the piston, not in the middle, but in a asymmetric position. When you do this, you repeat the, the same analysis and you see that the work on average is minus KVT, the Shannon entropy for a, a binary symmetric channel with probability P. So this is basically minus P log P minus one minus P logarithm of one minus P. This is a function that is concave and that has a maximum at one half. So for any asymmetric CLR engine, you get an H, an information that is less than, than KVT log two, 
So this means that the Silar engine is the one that extracts the most work from one single particle. With many particles, you can also generalize. And actually, we did with Matteo, we did a paper this year, and there's a lot of research on this, and it is uh, it is much less trivial than what I'm showing. Okay, I'm just starting with the basics, which is single particle silarity. Okay, another related uh, key topic is Landauer's principle, which is related in the sense that is kind of the opposite process in which we think about the erasure of a bit. So imagine you have a particle in a in a double well or, or in two halves of a of a physical system, and we can uh, think about it as a physical bit. So the state of the particle will be zero or one, depending on how close it is to this minima. If the particle is close to the, to the left minima, we say the state of the particle is a zero. And if it's close to the right minima, the state of the particle will be one. This uh, was um, idealized first time by Charles Bennett. And it is um, a physical implementation of a bit. And the process that I'm sketching in this, um, in this figure here is the erasure of a bit. So what you can do is, for example, tilt the potential, increase the, the minimum of, on, on the right well, and make, make it in such a way very, very, very slowly. You can do it also reversibly, this process. I will show you later experiments. You can do it in a way that at the end of this process, 100% of the particles, because you have to think that this is a system with fluctuations, imagine a colloidal particle, 100% of the, of the particles will end up in the left well, which is analogous to erasing a bit. You have a bit in zero or one, and you erase it, so you restore it to zero. What it was shown is that uh, by Landauer and Bennett is that even though you do this process infinitely slowly, you, you would expect when you do a process infinitely slowly to get zero entry reproduction because it's all the time in equilibrium. It is in one thermal bath, equilibrium, so I would expect the entropy production to be zero. But it turns out that it's not, that there is a minimum entropy production associated to the erasure of a bit. And this is related to the fact that you are breaking ergodicity. So time zero, the particle can, can uh, reach every part of the, of the potential of the phase space. But at the end of the protocol, the particle cannot, the barrier is very high, so the particle cannot jump between the left well and the right well. So there is a like a breaking of the, of the phase space into regions. And this has an energetic consequence. It means that, well, first an entropic consequence, there is a minimum dissipation or entropy production by uh, breaking the symmetry. But um, also this implies that there is a minimum amount of heat needed to, to erase a bit. So if you think about a computer, the computer has many bits. And every time you, you press delete, this deletes a lot of kilobytes or megabytes, gigabytes. Uh, here, Landauer was thinking about a very fundamental thing. What's the heat needed to erase a single bit, zero or one? And it, it, he showed that you need KBT log two of dissipation. So very similar to what uh, Silar was saying. And actually, you can unify this in, in a single framework. But I won't uh, go into this uh, by now. I'm just want to introduce your key results. OK, so here are classic reference and books uh, about this, Maxwell Demon. Uh, there's a very nice book uh, I recommend you here in the bottom. The papers of Landauer and Bennett are essential. And uh, the key point is that information is physical, as was said by Landauer, and erasing information caused heat. So if you want to erase information, for example, you can burn a book. Burning a book implies dissipation of heat. You need fuel, you need something to, to burn it. So this is something uh, intuitive, but that now we, we have a um, quantitative understanding for this. All right, so now I'll go into something a bit more uh, detailed, which is um, the theory of uh, thermodynamics of information processing in small systems. In particular, I'm going to follow a, a very nice piece of work that I really like, which is the PhD thesis of Takahiro Sagawa, it's called Thermodynamics of Information Processing in Small Systems. And I think this is chapter four, five, I believe. It is really amazing, this, this, um, this work. And Sagawa was uh, the, one of the two scientists who generalized the second law to systems with information. So the, sec the new second law, as you will see, it has 
information as a source of entry reduction, as you will see. Okay, so before starting, uh, I give you preliminaries on monitor information. So you have, now we will think about two variables. X is the state of the physical system and Y is what do we measure? So for example, X is the uh, position of a colloid and Y is the, what is the, the position that we measure? If we have a device that is imperfect, if the particle is here, maybe we think the particle is here. That's what is Y. For these quantities, we can define a mutual information, which is what I put uh, on the top, is nothing but the logarithm of the joint distribution divided by the joint distribution if these two variables are independent, which is px times py. This is what I put in brackets. So this, you can write it as the logarithm of the conditional probability of y given x divided by p of, of, of y, okay? Textbook, uh, this is in the course of, of Matteo, actually. Uh, information theory. This is a stochastic information. It's also called information density. So you have a random variable, you measure X, you measure Y, and then there is a probability that this is happening. So this neutral information depends on your actual measurement. What appears on the books more uh, often is the average of this information, which is called the ensemble average for the mutual information. This is what appears on the second line. By the way, do you, do you see my mouse if, if I am passing here? Do you see? Yes, you can see it. Yes. Okay, very, very nice, very nice. Sorry, because I was a bit lost. Okay, so this is the average of, of this quantity. And you can show that this is positive because this is, in the end, a cool back Leibler divergence between the joint distribution and the factorized distribution. Another important property is the symmetry property. So the information that X content, contains about Y is the information that Y contains about X. And secondly, it's relation to entropy. The information is the entropy contained in the variable Y minus the, the information about Y that you get knowing X. Okay, so this is the, how much do I gain information by knowing X? This is a very natural, very easy thing to prove. Okay, so now I will apply information theory to non equilibrium systems. So which situation I'm thinking about? The situation I'm thinking about, and I'm following closely this uh, chapter by Sagawa, is the following. Before we were uh, thinking about, okay, give me a second if I can do annotations. Okay, I cannot do annotations. It's a big pity. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, so this is the situation. Before we were thinking about a control parameter, so driving applied to a thermodynamic system. So we had this piece of the cake. Now we are doing what we call a feedback loop. So we are doing a, con a control, sorry, we are doing a, a protocol on the system and we measure X. So the outcome of the measurement, I call it Y. And what we do is given the measurement of Y, we change the control in the next step. This is done by a controller and this operation is called feedback or feedback control, okay? so. What I explained in my previous lectures didn't have this part. Okay, it was just, there was a driving and the system was responding to the driving. Now we have another element, which is feedback control. Depending on what we measure, we change something. Remember, the Silar engine was doing this because, uh, okay, Silar engine was doing this because it was measuring X well, here, y equals 2x, so it's a perfect demon. It doesn't make mistakes in the measurement. And then it applies, it does a different protocol depending on the measurement. That's exactly what I'm um, trying to generalize in this, in this image, okay? I define uh, the following variables. So xn is a trajectory, yn is a trajectory. This is of, of the system variable and this is of the measurement. This is the value of y at time tn and the same for x. And uh, here I introduce the feedback loop. So I measure x0, and this gives me y0, and this controls the uh, value of the parameter in the next step, which I call lambda c. And then I get x1, which measures y1, and it implies lambda 1. So we are operating in loops, applying feedback. And uh, the theory of Sagawa that I'm explaining has two assumptions. The first is that the measurement error, which means uh, what is the probability to measure a given y, given all the history 
I'm, I'm looking, it's independent on the previous uh, values of the measurement. So it's like the measurement error only depends on the history in X. It doesn't depend on what was my measurement in the previous step. This is the first assumption, sorry. And the second assumption is that there is no back action. This means the system is classical. If it's quantum, if I measure it, there will be a back action on the controller. Here we are neglecting this. In ma mathematically, it means the P xn, so this is the marginal distribution, is independent on whether we do measurements or not. Another thing is that I'm not assuming the measurement is Markovian. You can do it Markovian if this condition happens, if the probability to, to measure y at time n, given all the previous history of xn, only depends on the last observation of xn. This is called Markovian measurements. And uh, what I will show later is valid for Markovian measurements, but also for non-Markovian measurements. OK, reminder, without feedback, we had this. Always the same protocol, and the response of the system is fluctuating. So for to the same protocol, you can have many responses. This is stochastic, as I explained. Now we have feedback control. So we are measuring. This is the process. We measure y, and y designs the, the control parameter. So in every trajectory, we have a different protocol. That's the key difference between the two scenarios. What I was explaining in my third, fourth lecture, and what I'm explaining now. OK, if you want to see a nice example, those are nice in measurements, go to the, uh, actually, the chapter in this thesis is chapter 9. Go to chapter 9 to 1 and look at an example with a Gaussian um, noise in the measurement. All right. So now uh, let me start with uh, generic features of this theory. So the first thing I do is, well, I assume general non-Markovian measurements. And I calculate uh, here the probability for a given trajectory given a sequence of measurements, which is y up to n minus 1. And this implies a given control of the system. So what is this probability? Probability is, of course, the probability at time 0 to be at x0. And then uh, I'm factorizing the probability into, for instance, the probability that uh, I observe x1 given x0 and uh, y0. The probability, OK, then it comes y1 given x1. And then the probability to see x2 given the previous x1 and the previous control. So this is just in the spirit of the, uh, sorry, of the feedback loop that I explained here. It's just the probability for this process joint probability. OK, this is just probability theory. There's no, no fancy assumptions here. OK, so this was. Uh, the joint, this is the joint distribution to see a trajectory Xn and a measurement sequence Xn. These are sequences of uh, uh, states and measurements. This is what we really measure, and this is what we, what the, the system is doing. So now uh, let me define in this, sorry, this is, doesn't work very well. In this calculation, I will split two parts. One is this part and the other is this one, and I will define the part that has probabilities of y is given x, so this is probabilities of measurements given the state, I call it p sub c. This is the, this is be careful, it's not the conditional probability as I'll show later. It is something that they call p sub c of yn, sequence of measurements, given sequence of measurements, sequence of states x. And the rest is, you can see, you can take px0 with all these is the probability to see a sequence xn given uh, the protocol yn. So this is given the pro So please realize that this is probability of x given y, and this is the probability of y given x somehow. OK. What is important is you can check normalization of this. So when, when you build a probability distribution, the first thing you should do is to see if it's normalized, just to see that what you're doing makes sense. So I integrate over all x and all y's of this distribution. And it's very important how you take this integral. You have to use causality and start from the last thing that appears. You first integrate the yn, so it's the last measurement. And this is a, a marginalization. This is the integral of this is 1. Then you integrate over xn. This gives 1. And if you go on, go on, go on backwards in time, and you get 1. 
So all of these marginalizations give equal to one. This is the nice thing. From here, you can define marginals. So the marginal of a trajectory xn is integrating over y's, the same for the y, and conditionals. Conditional is the joint divided by the marginal of x given y, of y given x. Okay, and now it comes the key point in this theory that is the fact that this conditional distribution here is not the same as what I called before PC yn xn. This is when you go to this chapter and read it, this is the, the key. If you understand this, you probably understand the full chapter. This is very important. This is the note. Note P y given x, this is really the joint distribution, is not P sub C y given x. Okay. And we can build this because P y given x, sorry, I am making a mess. P y given x is P x comma y, the joint, which is this one. This was the definition I did before, divided by the condition P of x n, this one. So how can we get that P equals to PC? P equals to PC when P of xn given, sorry, sorry, this is not working very well. P of xn given the feedback, this one, is equal to Pxn. Okay, in this case, Pc is a conditional probability. But what does this mean? This means that the probability to see a trajectory given the feedback is the same as the probability to see a trajectory without feedback. So this is in general not true. This is true only if there's no feedback on the system. That's why these two distributions, so P, P, sub, P sub C is not the joint distribution in the feedback process, okay? All right, so this is a, an important uh, fact. And what you can do later on is to measure what is the mutual information from measurements. The information obtained from measurements is, okay, so I'm using the same definition as before for information, which is this one. But instead of putting P, I'm putting P sub C because it's the one that contains information on the measurements, on the measurement error, actually. If I measure this quantity, P sub C divided by P, I just apply the definition here. And I realize that this can be written as a sum of um, in information at time K. This is how much information does y at time k contain uh, about the full history given the previous measurements? And this is sum over all times. The most important thing is that this yc is not equal to i to the full mutual information. If you put here instead of pc, you put p. And this is because um, what I explained right before in the previous slide. But this is, a, this is just a, a detail. What is uh, the first thing that uh, we can find is an integral fluctuation theorem. So this quantity, I see, I sub C of base of fluctuation theorem, because when you average it with a negative exponential, you get P divided by PC, uh, which is something that I had, sorry, uh, P divided by PC, and then you need the joint distribution here. You can easily show it because I showed it before what is, for example, P divided by PC, you can build it with my previous slide and show that uh, there are two terms that cancel and you just get at the very end of the story um, uh, the joint distribution. So you can integrate first in X and then in Y and get that this is equal to one. This is just consistency and it's just a mathematical consequence. But what I'm going to say now, it is connected directly to physics, which is a fluctuation theorem, detailed fluctuation theorem for a fixed control protocol. So now, all the things that I'm explaining to you of information, I will connect to physics, to heat. So how can I do this? And the way of doing this is to consider first a fluctuation theorem given a control par um, protocol, okay? So what is this, this ratio? This is the probability in a forward experiment with this control parameter to find those with measurement yn and uh, state xn. This is the probability to have state xn given that you applied a given protocol. So this given protocol is for a fixed yn. So imagine you, you do this, okay, actually the best is this one. Imagine you do this feedback control protocol many, 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 many times 
and you get many, many control parameters. So many trajectories of the gamma. For each gamma, there is a y and an x. Actually, there are many y and x for each gamma. So now I'm saying I'm fixing gamma. What is the probability that for this fixed gamma, I, I see a trajectory xn? OK, this is what I'm putting here. What I put in the, in the denominator is the probability to see the time reversal of that, this, that trajectory that I'm seeing in the time reverse protocol that is cho cho chosen from the forward experiment. So I say, OK, in the forward, I had a, a control. And this produced me some y's and some x. So now I will look what happens if in the backward, I'm using the same control that obtained in the forward feedback. And it gives a, a, this, the time reverse trajectory xn. So this is freezing the control parameter is the same as what I did in my previous lectures, which was I had a control parameter. And then I look at priorities of trajectories. So this is related to the heat. In the, so I'm, I'm applying the same uh, theorems as the one I showed before because I'm fixing the control parameter. I'm fixing the protocol. So when I do this, I get that this ratio is related to the heat along the trajectory for this feedback. So of course, this is conditioning on x0. So if I remove that conditioning, it's multiplying by px0. I just get an extra term that is the system entropy. So I can go from here to here almost uh, immediately. All right, this is a, a bit mathematical, but uh, the nice thing is that later, what I can do is the following. So here I repeat, this is the pro, okay. Now I will do joint distributions. This is the joint probability to see Xn, Yn in a forward experiment with feedback given by lambda. Okay, so think about this, it's a joint uh, probability. And now I look at the joint probability in the backward process of seeing the backward trajectory, so the time reverse of Xn, and the same feedback. Okay. Why I'm just saying the same feedback? Because I'm going to apply feedback forward, and then I will take this one, and I will use the protocol that I got using this, this Yn, and I will reverse it in time. That's why I put Yn here. That protocol will be this lambda plus, and we can compute the ratio or the, the number of trajectories x, x n plus Yn in this backward experiment run with the trajectory of the forward. Okay, this is a, okay. This won't be trivial for you, but it's important that you review my video later because it, this is a, a non-trivial, and also to read the, the chapter of Sagawa where. You will, we will have more time to understand it. But the key point is that once you do this, these two quantities, you can do the ratio between them and show, okay, here I'm using the definition from before, the joint distribution is PC times PX given Y times PX zero. And here I'm doing the same thing for the backward and then introducing PYN over PYN. This is like multiplying by one. The important thing here is that this one here is equal to PYN because in the backward process, I am imposing to have YN from the forward. So this one is equal to PYN and factorizes with this one. After all, what you get from this ratio is the exponential of minus the entropy production, which is this part. Now we cannot see your mouse. I don't know why. You cannot see my mouse? Now? Yeah, uh, now, yes. Oh, OK. So when you do this operation, this, this one cancels with this one. And you get this part, that is the e to the minus entropy production from my slide before. And this one with this one, which is minus ic, what I explained at the beginning. So all in all, this is the fluctuation theorem with mutual information. The ratio between these joint uh, distributions is related not only to the entropy production, but also to the information. And this is very important. There is an information term that comes out of this ratio, which later on you can uh, use it 
to get a fluctuation theory. So now you can get that this average equals to one, and this average was is the average of e to the minus s minus i. So this is the integral fluctuation theorem with feedback. It is the same as what I explained, e minus s dot equals to one, but there is an information term here. Okay, so if you want to have a take home message of all this theory, which I highly recommend you to, to go through the chapter, I, I explain it. The take home message is this yellow equation here. There is a fluctuation theorem that has a modification with respect to processes without feedback. So without feedback, I see is zero and E minus S on average is one. With feedback, you have to take into account the information, okay? Information from the measurements. This is the IC. If you apply Jensen inequality, before I was telling you E to the minus S equal to one implies S is positive. Now is this one is positive. So S is greater or equal than minus KB the information. The information is actually positive. Sorry, I think here a plus should be there. There is a there is an error. The information is positive. So this means that the entropy production on average can be negative because of information. Okay, this, this is a way in which we explain what I was talking about of the seal art uh, before. So if you do this for an isothermal system, the total entropy is work minus free energy divided by temperature. I plug this here and I get that the work is get or equal than delta F minus KVT I. So you see that I it's positive and in the Silar engine, the information is the Shannon entropy and it's KVT log two. So this proves the energetics of the, of the Silar engine and shows that there is a, a source of entropy production that is information. So you could rewrite this equation as S dot plus I greater equal than zero and say there is a full entropy production, which has the part from the heat and the part from information. So we recover a second law if we interpret this information as a source of entropy, which is the way we understand now the second law. So there is not only entropy production from the heat, but there is also from information when there is feedback. This is the, the idea, okay? Uh, I don't know how much time do we have, but I wanted to show you some experiments in case I have time. Uh, we can also ten minutes. Ah, it's excellent. Very good. Um, okay, so this is the theoretical part. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't trivial for you, but um, I'm explaining uh, one of the most complete theories, and you can find examples. And, and in the review I gave you, there are simple cases, but uh, I'm trying to show you the one I like the most and the one I think is the most general. Okay. So please uh, review, go to the reference and, and study. Now uh, I'll finish with experiments. So th these um, principles have been tested in the lab. Uh, a very beautiful experiment is by John McCoffer's group uh, from the 2004, where they did a test of Landauer's principle in a feedback trap. Uh, a feedback trap is, is it's a device that can create with an electric field, any type of potential. What I showed you yesterday from our experiments was a parabolic potential and a, an external force that was random. This setup is different. Here, there's no external force, it's just a potential and it's done in a way that there is feedback. You see the particle here, you know the force here should be zero, so you apply force zero. You see the particle here, you, you want the force to be high and you apply that force. That's called a feedback trap. It is a beautiful experiment and they could do this type of uh, protocols of low increasing barriers, creating double wells, tilting. And these are trajectories of the particle that end up always in the same well. So this is a physical experimental realization of a Landau iteration. And here is the power of stochastic thermodynamics that you can take these trajectories and measure work, measure heat, etc., And they could check that this goes to KVT log two when you do this protocol. This is really a very impressive test, which uh, was actually done uh, even earlier in this nature paper in the Chilibertos group uh, in, in Lyon, where they did this with optical tweezers. 
So this is a different setup. It's not a feedback trap. It's an optical twister where uh, you also build up a double well by shaking two lasers within two positions very fast. And this way you can create a double well and tilting also the, the potential and, and moving the particle always to one of the wells. They could measure distributions of heat and get that it converges to a KVT log 2, 0 0.69 KVT. This is really, really a tiny measurement of heat uh, in this system. And uh, okay, there are more setups. We, we also did an experiment in, in Barcelona. Uh, there's a beautiful experiment by Yuka Pecola's group with electronic systems where they built an autonomous demo. It was the first time ever. I think it was 2018. So in these experiments, the ones I showed before, there is an external controller that is applying a device, uh, a protocol. But in the Pecola lab, they could do a demo that is autonomous, that you let it do it and it, it, it works on its own. So it's, it was very impressive. Uh, I'll give you the reference in the next lecture. Uh, this was also a breakthrough, 2010, uh, the group of Sano in Japan. They, um, what they did was something similar to this picture. So here you have a staircase and a particle goes more downhill than uphill. But if you have a demon that is very clever, uh, the demon can anticipate that the particle will fall and put a wall in a way that it only allows the particle to climb. This is a sketch, but they could do this with, um, with two um, uh, particles. It's a, it's a doublet of particles that are attached and, and they are uh, subject to an um, optical field. And they could uh, process information, measure information in a very precise way and get that uh, violations of the standard second law. So work minus free energy was negative in some cases. Moreover, this fluctuation theorem I told you about, which was this one with mutual information, it would be work minus free energy minus I. The I is stochastic in each run, and they could test it very, very precisely in this device. It was, it's a very impressive um, experiment where they had around 100,000 runs in each of these points. So, uh, I was very impressed when I read this in, in Nature Physics some years ago, and I really highly recommend you to, to go through it. And, and this is it. Uh, this is what I wanted to explain by now. Of course, this is a very active area of research, and I, I really, in one hour, I cannot do much better than this. Um, but uh, I really encourage you to, to go through the, through the papers. I recommend it to you. Uh, and also Mateo's course in information theory is online. Uh, it could be a very good um, combination with this, this lecture. So for me, this is it. And I'd like to uh, listen to questions if there is any. Maybe uh, Edgar, I have one. So uh, what is the difference between this IC and the mutual information? Well, IC is a mutual information. Because you said that uh, uh, PC is not uh, the condition of probability. Yeah, so PC so, is, is not exactly P. You see it here because PC, exactly. the difference with PC and P is this one. That PC has this um, conditional distribution. So it's the probability that the state was XN given that you implemented this feedback. Whereas PXN is the unconditional probability. This is the probability that the system took the state XN, but the feedback was anything. So, so it is the marginal. Yeah. Therefore, there is a, at least mathematically, I understand that the, there is a difference between these two. Yes, but then when you take, uh, when you compute I and IC, you should get two different results, no? Yes, 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 yes. I and IC are, are different. Uh, except in the case where you have only one measurement. So there is no trajectories. In that case, you get the same thing. This is what you can show. Uh, the way it's uh, understood in this, uh, in the book of Sagawa is that IC reflects the correlation due to measurements on the system, whereas I is the one due to feedback. Uh, I, I didn't get this part uh, very, very <laughs> extremely clear. I understand it mathematically, but I think what counts is that the way this is defined, because here I think that 
the point is that there is feedback. The, whereas if you don't put here uh, the C, okay, I think maybe the notation is not the best, but probably we have to go and understand uh, what is PC actually. So PC is shown here. So it's the probability of YK. So this is which was the, the, the measurement given the state. So I think this is, um, this is the way we, we, we introduce P sub C. But P is different because when you do the marginal here, you do PY given X, you have the joint, which is all this divided by the probability of X. So this is not exactly the same. And the way I understand this is like this, but uh, I don't have a much more intuitive understanding, which maybe you have because, um, uh, so I see it mathematically. It is not exactly the same as the joint middle information between Y and X. It is not exactly the same. Just because of this condition. Any other question? Sir, can you explain again? Uh, there was an expression where ratio of probabilities became exponential of uh, entropy. Uh, uh, here. Here, in the bottom? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, your doubt is how to go from here to here? Uh, exactly. OK. So, so in the first line, you have given x0 and given all this. OK? You follow yes. me? This yes, is gi given x0. But here, there's no given x0. So I have multiplied by p x0 in the top and by p x0 tilde in the bottom. Uh, no, no. The, even the heat part, I am. Uh... OK, here I use the fluctuation theorem that I explained in my previous lectures. There is a fixed protocol. So when you have a fixed protocol, the probability in a fixed protocol to get a trajectory divided by the probability in the same but time reverse protocol to get the time reverse trajectory is the heat. I mean, it's like, again, applying the local detail balance here. Yes, exactly, exactly. But uh, I mean, for these systems, I mean, OK, we are assuming that it's valid in these systems, even though Yes. yes, yes, because we said in the previous lectures that given a fixed protocol, here I'm fixing the protocol, eh, is the same setup as the non equilibrium driving I explained in my previous lectures. So, this is not the whole story of feedback, it's just the trajectories that were subject to the same protocol. This is the same as doing the same protocol once and again, deterministic yeah, yeah. protocol. Okay. 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 I understand, thanks. Okay, Marco. Excuse me, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is there some bond uh, between uh, IC and I? I mean, um, I could expect that uh, IC is bounded from above by I, in the sense that if I do not apply any protocol to uh, um, gain some uh, high quality information, I have the information with that protocol. Uh, this is a good point, and I don't know, I must say, um, because you see, I, I and IC are related by this factor. There is an extra term that is the log of this ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. Maybe one can prove that on average, one is bounded by the other. Uh, one should look at the papers of Sagawa, but uh, I never tried this proof. It's a, it's a good exercise, actually. Um, but it, it should be, in principle, no? Uh, at least intuitively, one would expect this. Yeah, I expect so. But uh, probably proving this is not so difficult because you just have to check uh, the average of the log of this ratio. If this is always greater than zero, okay, maybe yes. <laughs> but you have to check carefully. Uh, okay, thanks. But, but it's a very good question. Very good question. Other questions? Diploma students. Okay, so please uh, go through the reference I gave you. Uh, this will be very helpful. Um, and yeah, this is it for me today. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention and thank you very much, Edgar. Thank you.